thank you, thank you. So I'm feeling pretty awesome sitting in this real comfy chair watching the people look uncomfortable. Sorry, I hope, <laughs> I hope uh, we can get you some chairs. Ntanse and Totemtik, Niwo Magantik, Gakio Kitatum Scott in the Wow. Nigan ne naskama momoto yma simantu anokaki sikak ekwa matsu and ekwa kitsuatsit. Pik squista mona and pi wichina and samaksanan. Mr. Haya need siga sun, a papa say so tsinia. Tapwe mi ogisa gao. Mi o waitan e kututukuk. Anoka kisaka ni taka waiten kapeta man kikwe ota e mio a pati koin. So um, I know that most of you didn't understand what I said, but uh, as of course as I've learned, I'm not a fluent speaker, but I've learned how important it is to speak that language and to try to honor the place where it's uh, been spoken for thousands of years. And uh, I just acknowledge that uh, you can't really go anywhere else to learn that language. This is the place where it has to be. And so I just uh, greeted you all as friends and relatives. And um, I gave thanks for this, for life, for another day, for all the gifts. I said, it's a beautiful day. And uh, I told you my name. So one of my names is uh, Big Bear. It was a name that was given to me by uh, Gitea Kehio. Some of you might know Bob Cardinal from Enoch, Muskekose Enoch Cree Nation. Uh, he's the one who gave me that name about 15 years ago. And um, I continue to try to let that name guide me in the work that I do, how I live my life. And uh, what I've been learning over the years with Bob's help is that, uh, you know, in Cree culture, bears are connected with healing. Because they have to do with, uh, they're very similar to humans in that they have to pay attention to a lot of, just, of things because they eat a lot of different things just like we do. And so they're, they're trying to make sure everybody's working well together, that they're connected, healing in that way. So I try to follow that as best I can. Uh, I also have a Blackfoot name. So in Blackfoot, uh, we say, uh, So I'm a long distance runner. That's what that, that's what that name is about. And uh, got that name about 25 years ago. And uh, it was um, Spetequan, it's a tall man. He's passed away now. He gave me that name. And uh, <clears throat> It does uh, give you a little insight into what I like to do in my spare time, but uh, it's also, uh, I think, a much deeper kind of gift, that name, because um, when I asked him about it, he went like this with his hands. Remember, this is 25 years ago, he, and he said, people, you got people who live here, people who live here, and they don't talk to each other, they don't know each other. They don't understand each other. He said, what you're going to do is you're going to spend time here, and then you're going to run over here, and you're going to spend time. And you just keep running. He said, you, he said, you try to bring them closer together. So I always say that's a pretty good job description. Right? So um, that's what I try to do. And I also said, uh, you know, I'm really happy to have a chance to be invited to speak to you today, and I hope you find something of value in, in what you hear. Um, I normally take about half an hour to introduce myself. Because, uh, you know, the, the way I've been taught to think about it is if you're going to understand what I'm saying, you've got to know who I am. You have to understand my stories, right? Because then, you, then you'll understand better why I say what I say. But um, we're, all, we're all now at a, a performance-based institution. So I guess I, <laughs> I better stick to, you know, get down to business. Yeah. I'm only partly joking. <laughs> um, so in a world to quote Bob Marley, there's so much trouble in the world. 
There's so much divisiveness, there's so much fear, there's so much misunderstanding. It's really hard to know what to say or do sometimes. And uh, I'm entering the phase of my life now where I'm starting to think about the next generation of our family and then the next generation after that. And um, of course, like a lot of you, you think, oh, well, what, what, what are we doing now? What are we saying now that is going to affect them? You know, um, I know it, it's, it's kind of cliche to talk that way, but you try to think about it, you know, in, in real terms, I guess. And so in light of all that, you know, I just want to say that uh, um, the way I try to think about these things is in terms of complexity. Right? These issues are very complex. And so I don't think it's very helpful at all to enhance the divides that already exist or, you know, bring further harm. That, that's, that's not going to help. What we all need is balance, I would say. Some kind of balance. So these issues are complex and we have to think about them in that way. I guess I'm, I'm you know, tired of simple solutions to complex questions or complex issues, like separation from the rest of Canada. You know. The other thing is complicity goes with that complexity. So I don't feel I'm in a situation where I can go around and point fingers at you know, the people who are doing it wrong because I am implicated in a lot of these things. You know, I have worked at this institution. I've dedicated my life to working in schools and education. So I, I'm part of the, you know, I'm, I'm involved in perpetuating a lot of these things that I'm talking about. So I just want to acknowledge that. But, you know, in light of that, we, we still have to consider uh, how do we proceed in light of what we know, and what we acknowledge, how do we proceed. And so um, I'm a teacher. I study curriculum. And, you know, I talk to a lot of people who don't know anything about that, and the first kind of inclination is to think, you can tell by their body language, it's like, well, that must be boring, right? Because, <laughs> you know, we think of curriculum as these documents produced by jurisdictions that are in chart form that basically tell teachers what to do. And uh, that's part of it, of course, right? But of course, what is really the passion that I have in that field of study is that when you study curriculum and you think about it in terms of notions of knowledge and knowing, it, it has more to do with cultural assumptions. It has more to do with what knowledge we think or consider to be of most worth and, and how that gets prioritized or perpetuated. So, for example, why does everybody have to read To Kill a Mockingbird? Like, who decided? Why has that been continued, and what are the logics associated with that? Or Shakespeare, or you know, anything else we could mention. So that not so much to question those decisions, but to, in a kind of an archaeological way, to understand how that came to be. So that's what I'm most interested in. And so, you know, I tend to think about curriculum. Curriculum are stories we tell about the world and our place in it. And so pedagogy, for me, has to do with how we tell those stories and why we tell them that way. So I think even at grade 12 physics class, there's a story that's being told in that class, right? Of course, we don't usually recognize it as a story, but it's a kind of a story that's being told, and we have different logics that go with how that uh, takes place. Embedded in these notions of curriculum, these ideas of what people need to know, of course, is a model of a kind of a human being we have in mind. And that's the part that I find most interesting. So what's the human being that's being supported through this work? And how does it continue to be perpetuated in these educational settings? That, that's what I'm most interested in, to understand curriculum in that way, as directly predicated on sort of a theory of a human being. So. What are the curricular and pedagogical inheritances that we have here? And how do these relate to sustain sustainability and climate change concerns? So probably a lot of you don't know this, but uh, our education library has a very extensive archival collection. So 
you can go in there and if you're curious to know, for example, what kids in grade four in 1920 were learning in science class, you can go and look and see what the textbooks are, what the programs of study are. It's very interesting. I do that with my students. They try to get this deeper understanding of this tradition that they're participating in. Right? That's the way I think about it. But, you know, curriculum history in Canada and also in Alberta is very interesting. And I tend to look at it as both ideological and mythological. Right? And uh, it's highly political. In other words, if you pay attention to the political understandings and the priorities of the era, the curriculum is directly connected to that. And I use the word mythological not to say that they, it's falsehoods or they, they're making things up, because I think mythologies are actually expressions of the real values that the society has. What they value finds expression in, in those stories that the society tells about themselves, right? So they're actually truths. They're very insightful, in my view. And so, one thing we know, of course, is that Alberta is a bit unique in that we have, in the political history, we have a, this history of electing the same party over and over and over again, right? So we know that from 1971 to 2015, we had the same political party, we had the same basic ideology. I mean, of course, it changes through the decades. And so you won't be surprised to know that curriculum didn't really change in significant ways in Alberta during that era. Uh, of course, it did in 2015, or, or there was an attempt to try to change it, right? But one, what I wanted to share with you right now is that this is an excerpt from a book chapter that I wrote recently. There was significant change that began in 2009 with Alberta Education, uh, and it was called Inspiring Education, and they had an action plan. So I'll read some of this to you. So the conceptual framework which undergirded the idea of 21st century learning was largely framed in economic terms and in relation to a clear faith in the power of technology and innovation to spur economic growth. So here's a quote. Our education system must both provide an inclusive environment where each student belongs and equip them with the attitude, skills, knowledge, and competencies that they need to be successful in tomorrow's economy. The continued development of a highly skilled, knowledgeable, innovative, and productive workforce is critical to ensuring that Alberta sustains its competitive advantage in a global economy, allowing the province to attract investment and high-value-added industries. Now, embedded within this philosophy were a few things, uh, but three big ones were engaged thinkers, ethical citizens, with an entrepreneurial spirit was the specific language they used. So an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit would be exemplified by a student who creates opportunities and achieves goals through hard work, perseverance, and discipline, who strives for excellence and earns success, who explores ideas and challenges the status quo, who is competitive, adaptable, and resilient, and who has the confidence to take risks and make bold decisions in the face of adversity. So those are very, I think, clear statements on the kind of human being that what, you know, they had in mind in the creation of this, this document. So I'll just continue on to finish this. So the subtle subtext of these policy declarations is that 21st century notions of how best to be a human being are largely derived from neoliberal understandings of innovation, progress, entrepreneurship, competition, success, and well-being in the interest of building an economy. Youth are clearly positioned as future generators of economic wealth, and their contributing value as citizens is directly dependent on how well they replicate this prescribed value and build it into their emerging identities. Such faith in muscular entrepreneurship is a prominent part of the socio-political socio mythology of Alberta. I understand this ideological thrust, concealed as common sense, to be a form of ontological violence that has direct impl implications on the well-being of youth today. In the context of Alberta today, a frontier territory with substantial wealth generated from oil and gas exploitation, this ideology teaches that a person who is not participating in or benefiting from this prosper prosperity is clearly doing something wrong and needs to be corrected. 
So this initiative and this impetus that I just kind of outlined to you very briefly was, of course, sidelined by the previous government. And they began to work on their own initiatives. And we may have mixed reviews on that as well. Um, but um, one thing that I noted that probably a lot of you noted is that the current government's dismissal of those initiatives was based on the idea that they're too ideological. Right? That was the argument. And so that, of course, suggests that what's happening now is not ideological. And this is what I think is most critical for us to really think about because it gets presented as common sense. It gets presented as what you know, common folks, people would expect or want from a government. So what is the ideology of the current government? I think that's a very important question. And uh, this, is, uh, this is where um, myself, I uh, became really interested in this idea of homo economicus. And uh, in my studies, I first came across this term with the work of Carl Polanyi, who in 1944 wrote a book called The Great Transformation. But it was actually John Stuart Mill in the 1840s, I think, who first sort of described this kind of a human being. And of course, the, the beginning, homo, is, is meant to line it up in an evolutionary kind of line in that way that we're sort of building towards this. So homo economicus, I, I, I kind of assume that maybe, you know, people in the know, people who study that kind of stuff would consider it outdated kind of thinking. But there are, you know, several interesting books that are out right now that actually use that, that name that I came across. One is called The Death of Homo Economicus. And uh, that was published in 2017. Um, very interesting to look at. And then there's also, where are my friend Kivi and Sarah? There's a, there's a book on the literary history of Homo economicus that was recently published by Sarah Coleman, which also looks very interesting. So anyway, I was heartened to see that it wasn't irrelevant, that there are other academics who are also interested in this term. So here's how I've tried to define Homo economicus. Homo economicus. Economicus is a unique form of the human species that is understood to possess a natural propensity to be rational, individualistic, utilitarian, calculative, and instrumental in economic matters. Essentially, a dollar hunting animal. Human life is given meaning when the human is engaged in profit seeking behavior. Homo economicus is understood as primarily motivated by a self-interested desire for wealth and the accumulation of material goods as a primary measure of success. The question of what it means to be a human being is directly connected to the market and the benefits that accrue from it. Faith in and worship of the market is considered the primary purpose of humankind and questions regarding the meaning and purpose of human beingness are answered with direct reference to the market and what it offers us. Okay, so after kind of providing, that, I guess, some of that background, because I, I knew it was necessary, I, I'm, what I want to do now is just share with you, I guess, a lot of my own thinking on this with, with the hope that I can finish with enough time that you all will have a chance to add something or maybe, you know, there's something I forgot that you want to mention or you have a question that somebody can answer. We can do that. But um, what I want to say is that it's my view that issues of sustainability or concerns about climate change, um, they're not scientific or technological problems. And if we are going to solve them, it's not going to be science or technology that's going to do that for us. These are cultural problems, and these are spiritual problems, I would argue. And so um, one thing that I'm aware of is that schools, because I've spent a lot of time in them, schools are intensely cultural places. And they're the sites where the mythologies the culture, 
the inheritances are perpetuated most intensely. So this is why I'm so interested in this. So what are the characteristics of this cultural or spiritual problem uh, that you know, I'm talking about? And how is it related to the kind of human being that's being promoted in schools? So here um, I want to say that um, I, I define colonialism uh, as an extended process of denying relationships. So um, it's not a historical period. It's an ongoing uh, ideology. I would say. So we're wrapped up in a legacy of relationship denial that comes in many different forms. As an educator, one of the most damaging, I would say, is the denial of the relationship that exists between what's above your eyebrows and a little bit to the right and the rest of you, right? The way in which this, is, this separation on the, you know, has been imposed on the human being and the, um, I guess the consequences of that. And there are other relationship denials that I could continue to talk about. But um, related to that, in particular to Canada, I would say that the cultural or spiritual problem is related to what I've called a, a relational psychosis. So psychosis has to do with an imbalance that is, um, again, perpetuated in different ways. So. There are two things about this relational psychosis that I'll draw your attention to. The first one has to do with this question of whose land is this? And the land acknowledgments that we're getting used to. Because if a Canadian looks at an indigenous person and is able to say, okay, that person has deep roots in this place. Their ancestors have been here for a really long time. If you're able to recognize that, of course, what happens when that, ha when that occurs is that it immediately arises a contradiction. Because what it suggests is that a Canadian is a foreigner in Canada. And this is a contradiction that Canadian culture is constantly trying to avoid facing. Right? This is why, for example, residential schools were so important. Because it was a way to remove people from the view of Canadians going about their everyday business, to remove them from the landscape so that they wouldn't have to be confronted with this contradiction. So that's part of this psychosis that we continue to struggle with. And it, it shows up in all kinds of different ways, institutional and otherwise. The second one is uh, what I call the problem of ownership. And again, I don't think this is a very complicated idea, actually. So, if Canada claims sovereignty over this land and everything about it, and we don't question that, if an indigenous person or communities are perceived to be connected to the land and Canada owns that, well, then that means that Canada owns the people as well. Right? They own them and everything about them, actually. They own their language. They own their culture. And they even go so far as to say they own their children. Right? So this is this problem of ownership. And then we get this phrase, um, Canada's native people, right? as though those people are a possession in that way. And another aspect that I'll draw your attention to comes from um, some of you may know. His name is J Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell was busy, I think, in the 70s and 80s. He wrote a book called Myths We Live By. And what he was interested in was studying the mythologies of different societies and different cultures and showing how the way the people live and how they identify themselves is directly connected to those mythologies. So one of the examples would be, like, what's the role of ancient Greece in Greece today and how Greeks understand themselves, right? So he... he Joseph Campbell went around the world and he looked at different societies as examples. But one observation he made in an interview that I found that I found so insightful is he said, North American societies are very unique in the world because 
those societies are predicated on ignoring the mythologies that are connected to the place where they live. They're dedicated to ignoring them or dismissing them or trying to eliminate them. And so their mythologies actually, he said, describe another place, different from the place where they live. And so he said that's why in North America so many of the stories that the people are taught have to do with power and control and the exploitation of resources. And if you just think about, if you grew up in Canada and you think about the story, the creation story of the country that you were told, some of the images that might come up, forts, railroads, fur trade, Northwest Mounted Police, and so on, right? So my view, Joseph Campbell was very accurate. So we don't have a story to tell us how to live well here. Our stories describe a different place. That's what he was saying. Another thing I, I guess I wanted to mention right now uh, as well is that um, there's a, a, a pretty well-known Lakota philosopher who's passed away now. Some of you might know his name is Vine Deloria. Vine Deloria Jr., he wrote a lot of different sort of philosophical works. One of my favorites is it's called God is Red. And in there, Vine Deloria said that um, what he called Western sort of worldview is in direct conflict with indigenous worldview in North America because he said that indigenous worldview is predicated on a very intimate connection to place and all the kind of ecosystem implications of that, how the ecosystem is connected to the knowledge system. And so this very place-based understanding. And he said Western worldview is, is preoccupied with notions of time and development. So there's a zero year and everything, everything from that time gets bigger, better, stronger, faster, smarter. So it's, it's preoccupied with capital P progress, which runs in direct conflict with a place-based worldview. So he said this is at the heart of the relational psychosis, is this preoccupation with progress in relation to, you know, and I was thinking about this in relation to what uh, the current premier had to say a while ago, uh, the quote, really uh, kind, kind of made the hair on the back of my neck stand up because he said that Canada has too much crown, or Alberta has too much crown land in the north of the province. that's sitting unproductive and we need to make it available to people for development. That's basically what he said. Right? So this is like a very current, very practical example of this problem that we face. I'm going to hustle here a little bit because uh, I want to make sure you have enough time to respond. But at the heart of all of this, I would say, in my kind of take on things, is something that I think often gets missed. And th this is what uh, I, I guess I would call this the false universalism of liberal philosophy. So socially, politically, and economically, there's this idea that liberal philosophy is considered the apex, or the expression of the apex of human existence. And that those philosophies have created the most advanced societies that we have ever known, and nothing will replace them. Nothing will be superior to those. So everything important to know originates within those philosophical understandings that's mostly been in the last 500 years or so. Before then, nothing important happened. Right? That's part of the message, which of course discounts wisdom traditions all around the world, including here, where actually people were living quite successfully uh, and they weren't part of that knowledge system. Right? So what I have noticed is that there's very much an institutionalized promotion of the forgetting of wisdom insights about life and living from around the world. We're carefully trained to accept the view that wisdom insights from earlier eras are irrelevant to us today. And that the needs of human beings supersede the needs of all other forms of life. This is at the heart of liberal philosophy. And what I would say is that um, 
Liberalism has the power and the influence to define the human and universalize those attributes and impose them on most of the, the people it encounters. And so it's this invitation to join us in this march towards progress. And if you decline that invitation, you will suffer the consequences. It will be your own fault. Right? So this is the gift of liberalism, I would say. Um, here I'm relying on a book that some of you might be very interested in. It's called uh, The Intimacies of Four Continents. It's a very recent kind of publication. What the author, I can't remember the name of the author, but she, what she shows is that liberal philosophy is embedded in, in the whole colonial project. It's embedded in slavery and the different problems that have created. And what liberal philosophy has the ability to do is it has the ability to constantly recenter re itself, morph, transform, and recenter itself as the answer to any question you might ask. So she traces historically the development of liberal philosophy and tries to show how it's embedded in most of the problems that we face. Right? So she says, here's a quote, the contemporary moment is so replete with assumptions that freedom is made universal through liberal political enfranchisement and globalization of capitalism that it's difficult to imagine alternative knowledges or ways of being. And just as a comment, one thing I've noticed is that through our own process here in our own country, truth and reconciliation, calls to action, what I notice is people go to liberal philosophy, concepts from liberalism, and they try to center those. So we get a ramping up of diversity talk, inclusiveness talk, equity talk. I don't have anything against those. But my point would be there are other philosophies that have something to say about how to live well. And we continue to delimit our opportunities to imagine something different if we go back to the same things that have already got us to this point that we're at right now. So we are stuck reasserting or representing the very philosophies uh, that are foundational to the world as we know it now. So I'm interested in the work that I do in trying to help people unlearn the false universalism of liberal worldview and question the common sense notions of knowledge, knowing, and human beingness that stem from that false universalism. So my assertion would be that if we seek a different kind of human being, and maybe sustainability work is interested in that, right? If we seek a person who lives according to different cultural assumptions, then meaningful engagement with different notions of knowledge and knowing is critical to that project to address the cultural and spiritual problem that we face. Now, one of the complications of this that I've encountered in my own work is that you won't address this problem in a purely intellectual way. Like, one of the insights that we get from elders is that uh, you don't change the way someone thinks by telling them that they should change the way that they think, right? So this is one of the limits of us meeting like this, right? You change the way someone thinks by giving them opportunities to change the way that they live, by giving them opportunities to change what they spend time doing with themselves, right? So, uh, in my own work, we are, and, and some of you have uh, you know, been part of this, uh, I won't spend too much on, time on this, because um, I want to tell a story that's related to all of this, but um, I'll just say that that River Valley Walk that maybe some of you have been a part of is my attempt to try to help with that, to try to help people imagine something different, to imagine how to be a different kind of human being. It's very limited. I know it's just a couple of hours, but it's very important to be beside the river, to, to, to listen in a different way, and to just be together in, a, you know, in ways, I think, that uh, wake up something inside of people that's been put to sleep. That's the way I see it. And so I'm very interested in uh, 
trying to promote this idea that we need to approach places as living relatives because they are. It's not just a metaphor. We're surrounded by life. And so in a lot of those wisdom teachings, to approach a place as a living relative is to um, honor the life that's there, all the life that's there. And to understand that you give life, when you honor that place, you give life to it and it gives life back to you. So it's this reciprocity that I'm interested in as a kind of a human uh, desire that I think most of us have. Embedded with that are kinship understandings. In Cree, we say, which is this idea that we're all related, but at the same time, we're surrounded by life that we're also related to. And that's a, that's a very central treaty teaching as well that's embedded in that, that we're related. And it's not just a human-to-human -human agreement that we're trying to sort out. It involves all forms of life around us, which is a very different kind of imagination from considering a treaty as like a contract or a business deal. Um, and also, um, within my own work as a, someone who studies curriculum, as I said earlier, at the heart of any notion of curriculum is the idea of a kind of a human being we have in mind. And if, if you bring to mind that treaty medal and that image of the Queen's representative shaking hands with that indigenous person, I would say the way to characterize the history of education so far is that instead of a balanced handshake, a partnership, that Queen's representative has repeatedly tried to pull that indigenous person over to their side and to insist that you have to become like me. You have to accept everything that I have uh, if you're going to be successful, right? So what we need now is a different notion of citizenship that honors Canadian nation and nationality, I think it's very important that we understand that you know, we are also living in Canada. We have to honor that. I'm part of that. But at the same time, there's another notion of citizenship, we might say, that exists in particular places all around this country. And what I'm interested in is a notion of curriculum that's like a balance of these, these two different notions of human beingness that can be side by side, that they don't have to compete, they don't have to outdo each other, we don't have to choose one or the other. Because I think whoever you are, wherever you come from, you need to know about that ancient understanding of what it means to live well here. Uh, and that's, that's actually what the people who negotiated that treaty, the way I understand it, that's what they wanted. Seven generations ago, that's what they wanted, is that somehow our ancestors you know, the way they saw it, some, that somehow we would start to work this out in a balanced way. And um, I haven't heard, um, I guess, any, any talk of this kind from any of our leaders. And I, myself, uh, I think it's time that we start insisting on it. Um, and that's, for me, the the logical next step. Um, maybe I'll just finish with a story that I think has a lot to do with uh, all of these things that I just mentioned. And uh, in telling this story, um, what I want to acknowledge is that, of course, there is a paradigm at work that's influenced all of us that um, basically tells us that the story I'm about to share uh, is not to be taken seriously that it's uh, metaphorical, that it's kind of made up. You know, people entertain themselves before literacy kind of presented itself, and that uh, it, it's just kind of an interesting cultural artifact. So I just kind of put that out there for you. So this story is connected to those uh, seven stars that you see in the sky um, that we call the Big Dipper. Uh, in, in these teachings, it's a, it's a pipe, a spuagan. And that's part of the reason, if you know about that constellation, you know for a whole trip around the sun, it moves in a circle. 
And that's why if you've ever been to a pipe ceremony, that pipe is also moved in that way because we're trying to align ourselves with that, cos that cosmology. We're trying to make ourselves part of that, right? So in case you didn't know this, the sun and the moon are actually husband and wife in this story. So the moon is the wife because she's connected to the cycle of a woman's body. So I don't have time to get into the details, but they had a disagreement. They had a conflict. And the son knew that uh, it was going to cause a rift between them. So what he did is he told his seven sons, who make up what we call the Big Dipper, he told them to each collect a gift and be ready. So the trouble started, and what happened is the son and his sons were moving, and the moon was chasing them. So you can imagine this cycle replicating itself constantly as you listen. So when she got close, the first son threw his gift back, and it was a, a bladder bag full of water. And it hit the ground, and it created a big body of water, and it separated them. So she was further away, and they managed to get away. But she negotiated that, and she started to catch up again. As soon as she got close, the second boy threw back another bag, or actually it was a rock. He threw back a rock, and the rock hit the ground, and the mountains were created. It separated them. She caught up again. The next thing that was thrown back by the third one was a stick. It hit the ground, created a forest, separated them. She caught up. The next one was uh, the boy used his finger and he made a line in the ground and it created this big canyon, separated them. She negotiated, she caught up. Then there was a boy who had um, a bladder bag full of air and he threw it back. It hit the ground and it created this powerful wind that pushed her back. Eventually it died down and she caught up again. Then there was a boy who had this beautiful, colorful bird he threw it back. It was a thunderbird. And it created a, a powerful storm, lightning, rain over top of her. And she slowed her down. They got away. Finally, we get to the seventh one. I think that's seven. Um, and this time, the boy threw back a bladder bag full of air. And when it hit the ground, it pushed up and created the atmosphere. And the sun and his sons were pushed up and separated from earth. That's how they got to the sky. And the moon, she had her own medicines, and she was able to penetrate the atmosphere, and that's how she got up there. And so this cycle continues to play itself out. And in this story, those seven gifts are considered conduits of energy in, the, in this world where we live. And uh, energy is dispelled through them. And uh, what's happening now is that we're putting too much energy into this system. And those gifts are trying their best to continue to expel the energy, but we're asking too much of them. Right? And they're not going to be able to keep it up. That's, that's, what, that's what the elders say. Now. They're trying, those gifts are trying their best to help us, but they can't continue on. So that's that story of the seven. Yeah. So I think that's enough for now. Uh, so maybe you have something you want to say or a question. You can do that now. Go ahead. Yeah, well, so I'm guessing, so the question is, how do we get, how do we get more spirit in Deliberations on environmental issues? Yeah. Is that doing too much violence to your, what you said? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess uh, some of the people I hang out with, we've talked about um, secularism as a, a very prominent value of, of liberal philosophy and, and how um, I think there's a public policy issue that's emerging for us that may kind of be spurred on by, I guess, people's desire to uh, 
honor indigenous insights, but there is no secular understanding of indigenous knowledge that I've ever, ever been exposed to. And I, in fact, I would say the elders that I know say uh, it's inc very dangerous to remove the spirit from a lot of these, uh, I, these notions, right? Um, it, it perpetuates a kind of an imbalance. And so, um, you know, I, I guess one thing I've thought about is, uh, is that uh, our institutions in this country are supposed to be secular, but they're actually not, I would say. I, th I think a lot of the decisions that are made are, are rooted in Christian culture and Christian values. And uh, I don't have a particular problem with that myself, but I think we have to be able to talk about it, right? And, and start to think about these things um, in those ways, but uh, the best I can say is that you could try to have some of your meetings outside, <laughs> beside the river. And I get this question a lot from students who, of course, you know, the body language says, you know, I don't want to, uh, I don't see myself as the teacher of spirituality, right? Or, you know, how, how do I promote spirit in my classroom? And, uh, you know, what I say usually is, uh, I don't think spirit has to do with faith necessarily. To me, it has to do with honoring life. And I think even the most dedicated biologist is involved in honoring life. And that life, in some ways, and even in a biological way, has a kind of a mystery to it. Right? And that's what we try to honor, I would say. Those are the conversations I try to have, anyway. That probably doesn't help you very much, but yeah. yeah. Anybody else have something to say about that? Please, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's a really good question. I guess myself, I've always been guided toward balance. And uh, again, that, that treaty handshake. Um, I talked earlier about my complicity, right? And I, now I think myself, what I always try to remind myself is that all societies um, need to exploit resources uh, in certain ways, right? So it's going to be hard for us, you know, to, to live the societies as big as they are unless we're exploiting resources in some way, right? And so there's a lot of technology and scientific knowledge that's been created that uh, I think we need to hang on to. But um, I think that issue of balance is, is, could really be up to us as citizens, right? How to negotiate that, right? And um, I, I guess when I think about uh, hope, that's what I imagine is this balance, right? So uh, there's going to have to be, in any kind of balance, there's always things we let go of. Yeah? I think all, all forms of knowledge have their poverty and have their strengths. And, and that's what we have to try to work. That's our challenge. Yeah? That's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, first I'll say, based on what you just said, that I think you're much further along in, in sort of trying to, um, trying to unlearn than uh, most people that I've encountered, you know. Uh, one thing that I've kind of had lots of breakdowns on is, is how does change come about, the kind of change that maybe I would like to see. Uh, will it come from going to every meeting that I can possibly get entrance into on this campus and talking to people in boardrooms and pounding on tables and, and trying to argue? Or will it come from me in my own classroom when the door's closed, being able to support and guide people and try to encourage them in their own way to try to do the things that you know, we think need to be done? And, uh, I guess I've, I've struggled in both, but lately uh, it's the second one that uh, you know, I'm dedicating most of my time to. Um, and I guess I would encourage you to try to do the same. Outside of your classroom? Uh, inside and outside the classroom, yeah. I mean, that moment you have with those, those students that you're working with, 
and the chance to uh, present them with something meaningful. I think myself, that's where I get the most kind of energy. Not sitting in some, some big meeting room, again, trying to convince some decision maker that uh, what I say matters. Right? Um, I think we spend too much time and energy on, on that kind of stuff. Or that's, I guess, my own my criticism of myself. Yeah. So that, that's the best I can say. Continue to try to learn more. Continue to try to be the kind of teacher that you, know, you would want for yourself. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.